Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Norland. I'm Senior Economist with CME Group. Um, I would like to welcome you to this webinar um, yeah, with my colleague David Gibbs, also from CME Group. Um, and just, of course, thank everybody at Tickmill, um, as well as my colleagues at CME Group, who uh, gave us the opportunity to set this up uh, to talk about a lot of very, very exciting trends that are happening in global equity markets um, and interest rate markets and how those two sets of markets are very, very closely interlinked. Uh, my role in the webinar will be to talk about the economy, uh, the macroeconomic aspects of what's going on, uh, what might happen to the equity markets in the future. Um, and then uh, my colleague, David Gibbs, who works on our education team, um, will uh, be able to delve into the details of how all of these futures contracts work, um, how potential trading strategies could be set up. Um, now, bear in mind, uh, we do have a lot of disclaimers on this presentation. Um, the first set of disclaimers comes from Tickmill itself. Um, they've asked me to read the disclaimer out loud at the beginning of the uh, webinar. And the disclaimer says the material provided is for informational purposes only and should not be considered uh, as investment advice. Uh, the views, information, or opinions expressed in the text belong solely to the author and not to the author's employers, organization, committee, or other group or individual or company. Um, there is an additional risk warning uh, which states that trading futures and options comes with a high risk of losing money due to leverage always ensure that you understand these risks before trading. Um, in addition to their disclaimer, CME also has its own disclaimers, um, you know, basically saying that there is no investment advice given or intended. Um, this webinar is really only for educational purposes. Um, and of course, we have our own very long disclaimer um, that basically describes CME's organizational form and how we are regulated in various parts of the world, including the United States and various European countries. Um, so with that in mind, um, I thought I would start with what I think is the most extraordinary set of developments um, that we have seen in the economy um, in many, many years. Uh, we see this here in Europe. I'm based in London. Interest rates here, of course, are soaring. Uh, we've seen the Bank of England raise interest rates from a quarter point to 4%. Uh, we've seen the European Central Bank raise rates from 0 to 3%. Both of these central banks, uh, by all appearances, have further to go. Um, there were a number of uh, economists, or I should say uh, members of the Monetary Policy Committee um, at the Bank of England who spoke to the press today saying that they were thinking of another 50 basis point move um, at their upcoming meeting this March. Um, and what's extraordinary about all of this is that the European banks are still so far behind the curve. They still have interest rates uh, way below the level of inflation. Um, inflation at the core level in Europe is at 5%. In England, it's over 6%. And the banks aren't even getting interest rates within 200 basis points of that at the moment. Um, it's a little bit of a different story in the United States, which will be kind of the main topic of this presentation. Um, the United States, as I'm sure many of you know, also has its highest rate of inflation since the early 1980s. Um, and in the United States, the Federal Reserve has been a bit more aggressive than the European central banks have. Um, they've raised interest rates uh, so far by 450 basis points. Uh, the market, as we will discuss, is pricing that they probably have three more 25 basis point moves uh, that will likely take them to around five and three eighths percent, uh, bringing rates basically in line with where they were on the eve of the global financial crisis. Um, now, the global financial crisis, as we know, was a very, very rocky period for the equity market, to put it politely. Um, yeah, between the market's peak in October 2007 and its bottom in March 2009, the S&P lost 60% of its value. Um, so I think that there's a lot of potential for extreme volatility in equity markets that could result from all of these rate increases. Uh, but what's even more astonishing, I think, is here in Europe and also in the United States, um, it's not just the amount of rate hikes, it's the speed at which they have happened. Um, it's truly extraordinary. The last time we had more rate hikes in a 12-month period in the United States was back in 1981. 
you have to go back 42 years to find any comparable period in US history. But there's been a lot of economic changes since the early 1980s, and even a lot of changes since the financial crisis began in 2007. And one of those big changes is the level of debt and leverage in economies. Um, debt levels have been increasing all over the world. Back in 1981, the last time the central bank in the US hiked rates as much as they have this time, the debt levels were less than half of where they are today. Total public and private sector debt in the United States in 1981, when the Fed last raised rates this much or more, was 130% of GDP. Now it's 260%. What that means to me is that the consequences of rate hikes are twice as big today as they were back then. Uh, because we have tremendous amounts of debt and leverage in the economy. Now, the debt and leverage didn't matter much during the last decade. Why? Because interest rates were zero. And when interest rates are zero, it doesn't really matter how much debt you have if you don't have to pay anything to finance it. But now the cost of financing that debt is extremely high. And not just here in the US, it's high throughout Europe as well. And this could create a lot of volatility and on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, in our equity markets, bond markets, um, as well as even commodity markets, uh, which we'll talk about in some of our future presentations, but not so much today. Um, now, one of the big questions I've been hearing is, well, given that we've raised rates so much, why is the economy not already in a recession? Um, and indeed, if you've been paying attention to the economic data over the last few weeks, you know that we're kind of in the opposite of a recession right now. Um, we saw explosive growth in employment in the month of January. The US added half a million new jobs in one month. Um, we just got consumer spending data earlier this week showing that Americans increased their spending 3% in the month of January, a tremendous monthly increase. Uh, we also got somewhat stronger than expected inflation data. Um, so one of the questions I'm hearing a lot is, well, given all the rate hikes, you know, does this mean that monetary policy is not having any effect? And it doesn't mean we shouldn't be worried. And a very short answer to this question is no. Um, we should be very, very concerned about the degree to which the Fed has moved policy. Uh, we should be concerned as you know, participants in the economy, but also as investors in equities, uh, bonds, and in other kinds of financial or commodity assets. Um, so what's going on here? Well, there, one of the most famous phrases in economic history is that there are long and variable lags between monetary policy changes and when those changes affect the economy. Um, and so economists often estimate that when the Fed or any other central bank moves policy, it takes typically six to 24 months to impact the economy. Um, and you can see this very clearly in this little table here. Um, if you go back to say the last three recessions, so we'll, we'll talk about the last four recessions. I'm gonna skip the one in 2020. Uh, because the 2020 recession, to my mind, was a little bit artificial, uh, or actually very artificial. It happened primarily because of pandemic lockdowns. Um, we don't know what would have happened to the economy had the pandemic not happened. But let's go back to June 2006. Um, so if we just go back here to this previous chart over here, um, you can see in 2004 to 2006, the Fed hiked rates 425 basis points. So they stopped hiking rates in June 2006. And guess what? The economy was just fine. It was just fine in July 2006 and August 2006. In fact, it was just fine even in the first half of 2007. It kept growing. It wasn't really until the summer of 2007 that the very first problems really became apparent. And the economy did not officially fall into a recession until December. 2007. That was 17 months after the central bank stopped hiking rates. Now, the Federal Reserve, according to our Fed funds futures, probably won't stop hiking rates until June. So it might be that we don't have a recession until maybe the end of 2024. But don't think for a minute that all these rate hikes, which by the end of the cycle could 
the over 500 basis points of rate hikes are somehow not going to have an effect on the economy. If you go back a little bit further to May 2000, uh, the Fed did its last rate hike. The economy continued to grow until February 2001. It did not have a recession until March 2001. That was 10 months later. Uh, if you go way back to the previous recession, the Fed stopped hiking rates in February 1989. Uh, we did not have a recession until July 1990, 17 months after the Fed was done hiking. Um, so yeah, the economy right now is booming, but this is very treacherous times for investors, for policymakers, and for economists. Uh, because right now we are in the lag time between a massive tightening cycle and when that tightening cycle is eventually felt by the economy. Um, now, one of the big questions facing the Fed um, is what are they going to do about inflation? Uh, well, the problem that the Fed is facing right now and the bond market is facing is has to do with its own pricing for inflation. Uh, the bond market earlier this year I was pricing what some people started to call um, immaculate disinflation. Um, the idea that inflation was just going to go away by itself with no help. Um, if you go back to even three weeks ago, the bond market was pricing that this year we're going to have 2% inflation. So think about that. We had 8% inflation last year, 2% this year, just like no transition. It was just going to happen like that. Um, well, the bond market started to change its view in the last couple of weeks as a result of some of these strong numbers. Um, so now the bond market is pricing around 3% inflation for the next year, and then around 2.25% inflation for the year after that. But one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, is this realistic as pricing? Well, when you look at the interest rate markets, the interest rate markets have changed their views a lot. Uh, so we spoke a minute ago about that blowout employment number that we got earlier this week, uh, or, or say earlier this month, uh, showing on, you know, it was two weeks ago today, showing that we had created half a million new jobs in January, quite unexpectedly. Um, since then, we got the strong retail sales number, higher than expected inflation numbers, and all of this has pushed markets' expectations for interest rates higher. Um, the market still now thinks that the Fed is going to hike rates three times, going to finish its rate hikes in June, keep rates kind of on hold maybe until September or December or so, and then it's going to start slashing interest rates. And it's going to eventually cut interest rates down below 4%. Now, this is a big change. A few weeks ago, the market thought they'd cut interest rates to below 3%. Um, but all of this has created a little bit of rockiness in the equity market these last few days. Or the equity market has started uh, to sort of teeter a bit um, you know, as investors start to lose a little bit of confidence. Um, so when you look at the equity market, it's, I think, in a very, very perilous state. Um, it's perilous for, I think, two reasons. First, it's overvalued. And secondly, it depends on low interest rates and low inflation. So let's talk about its valuation. Um, here we have in black the S&P 500's market capitalization as a percentage of gross domestic product. Um, you can see it's still 140% of GDP. Um, now it's down. You know, a year ago, um, at the beginning of 2022, I was at 180% of GDP, which was its highest level um, since at least 1929. Um, now it's down to 140%, but that's still very richly valued. Um, now, the other thing you see on this chart is the yield of a 10-year U.S. Treasury. Um, and so what you can see more or less in this chart is that there is some sort of inverse relationship between the level of bond yields and the valuation of the equity market. Uh, when the equity market, actually when bond yields are at very low yields like they were during the 1950s and 60s, and like they have been uh, for much of the last couple decades, the equity market can support very, very high levels of valuation. Um, by contrast, when bond yields are higher like they were during the 1970s and 1980s, the equity market supports very, very low levels of valuation. Um, you know, in 19, the early 1980s, when the equity market hit bottom, um, it was valued at 30% of GDP. 
to think about that, that we're at 140% now. If we go back to 30%, that implies roughly a 75% decline in the value of the equity market. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying it could happen if inflation does not come under control. Um, and so the threat here is that if inflation does not come down, that bond yields could continue to rise just like they did during the 1960s and 1970s. And you know, during the 60s and 70s, the, especially the late 60s, throughout the 70s into the early 80s, the equity market performed very, very badly. It lost 70% of its value relative to inflation. Um, now, another thing that makes me nervous about equities is their dependence on quantitative easing. Um, so the way in which I'm going to show this is by using one of CME's lesser known products, a uh, product that's mainly aimed at institutional investors, but it's interesting for everybody to look at, even if you don't trade it. And that's S&P annual uh, dividend futures. Um, and so what these futures show um, is they show an expectation for what investors think is likely to happen in the future. It's sort of like a forward curve for dividends rather than for interest rates. What's really weird about this is you still have the stock market trading at very, very high valuation levels, 140% of GDP. And yet when you look at the annual dividend futures, uh, which basically price the amount of index points worth of dividends that will be paid out by S&P 500 companies um, every year for the next 10 years, um, the market does not believe that between now and the end of 2033, that we're going to see any growth in corporate earnings, none. And if you inflation adjust it um, using the difference between uh, classic US treasuries and treasury inflation protected securities, investors actually price that earnings are likely to decline. Um, so this is really astonishing pricing. It's very, very interesting that the market could be trading at such high levels when investors take such a bearish view of where dividends are going. Now, um, when you look at the history of the dividend futures versus the S&P 500, things get even more curious. Um, and so what's really curious about this is if you take the current year's annual dividend contract and you add it up with the next 10 years of divid expected dividends, uh, what you get here is what you see in the black line, um, the nominal non-adjusted value of the next 10 years of dividends. Um, and so, since the beginning of 2018, so for five years now, the market has been pricing that will be paying out roughly 580 S&P points of dividends over the coming 10 year period. Um, and that hasn't really changed very much. I mean, it's chopped around a little bit, but overall the level hasn't moved too much. But what's really weird though, since the beginning of 2018, the S&P went from 2,900 now to 4,200. The S&P is up over 50%. And yet the market doesn't think companies' earnings are going to be any better than they thought they were going to be five years ago. Um, so in markets, the way in which interest rates and equities are typically sort of uh, joined together, if you will, um, from a theoretical perspective, is that you're not really supposed to look at the nominal level of dividends. You're supposed to look at the net present value. Uh, so what we do here is we take that same black line we saw in the previous chart where it says nominal non-adjusted value of the next 10 years of dividends. We've now recalculated it to discount it for the level of interest rates. Um, in theory, equity markets are discounting machines. They take future cash flows and they use interest rates to discount them back into the present value. Um, so what's interesting about this is that in 2016, 17, 18, 19, in the first three months of 2020, um, the S&P mostly went up and that was explained not so much because investors were becoming more optimistic about earnings, but rather something else. Rather it was because investors um, were becoming more pessimistic about interest rates. So interest rates were falling and that was increasing the value of future earnings. But then something happened in March, 2020, the two lines start to diverge. They had been moving in lockstep, then they start to diverge. So what happened in March, 2020? Well, that was during the early stages of the pandemic. And that was when the Federal Reserve decided it was gonna print $4.8 trillion 
worth of money and use that money to buy bonds, uh, mainly treasuries, some mortgage bonds, and even a little bit of corporate bonds. Um, and that created a huge, huge divergence where the S&P 500 started to soar, um, eventually going to 4,700, while the net present values of dividends is actually lower now than it was for much of late 2019. What this suggests to me is that the S&P 500 is probably about 1,200 points overvalued. It probably needs to come down very, very significantly to bring itself back in line with the market's valuation. Um, now, that doesn't mean that's gonna happen. This is not making a prediction for what's gonna happen. Markets can stay out of line with reality for a long time. Um, in addition, other things could happen. It could be interest rates drop, um, in which case the value of those uh, earnings would go up. Could be that investors become more optimistic about future earnings, so that could bring the dividends back up towards the S&P. Um, but for the moment, um, it looks like there's still a very, very wide gap here, and that gap hasn't really begun to close. In fact, if anything, it's even widened out further during the last year. Um, and so what makes me really nervous about this is that that gap opened up when this happened. Uh, when the Federal Reserve, which you see here on its balance sheet in blue in March 2020, expanded that balance sheet by $3 trillion in three months. And then after it was done doing that, it continued to add $120 billion per month up until about this time last year, which was, to my mind, amazing. You know, at this time last year, it was clear to everybody who was looking at the data that we had an inflation problem. And yet, 12 months ago, the Fed had not yet raised rates and it was still printing money, which is crazy, but that's what they were doing. Um, and so now the Federal Reserve is doing the opposite. They're letting all of the stuff they bought roll into maturity and they're not buying it back. Um, so we're starting to see a tremendous contraction in the Fed's balance sheet, a tremendous contraction in the money supply. And so one of the big questions is how much longer is the rate tightening cycle going to last? And a lot of that depends on what happens to inflation um, and what happens to the employment market. So the good news on inflation is we do seem to be past the peak of inflation, both in Europe and the US. However, the employment market remains very, very tight. If you look at the Eurozone, unemployment is below by over half a percent where it was at the end of 2019. In the US, as I'm sure you saw two weeks ago today, we printed a 3.4% unemployment rate. That was the lowest since 1969. Um, the lowest in you know, 54 years, you have to see, go back to get a lower employment or unemployment rate. Um, and what's even crazier about this is that employers in the United States are looking to hire 11 million new workers. They have 11 million job listings. I, I went to Chicago a few weeks ago. I walked by you know, a Five Guys Burger. They're hiring people for $17.85 an hour. Um, you walk by almost any restaurant in the United States, as well as a lot of hotels and other service enterprises, they're having trouble finding workers. They're desperate for workers and they're not finding them. Um, so wages are going up. As wages go up, that could be potentially very, very inflationary. Uh, but there's something also really important in the inflation data. Uh, we just got the inflation data earlier this week, and it was sort of a small upside surprise, but it was very, very upsetting to the market for the reasons that we mentioned. Market's overvalued, and it depends on inflation coming down and low interest rates. Um, so what was particularly upsetting about this number for the markets, I think, was one component. Um, but it's the biggest and most important component of inflation, which is the cost of home owner, or the cost of renting a home. Um, home <clears throat> rentals account for 34.4% of the CPI index. That's more than a third of the index. Um, and rental costs have been rising by 7.8% year on year. Now, in the United States, the cost of renting a home typically follows the cost of buying a home with a lag of about 21 months on average. Um, so the cost of buying a home was increasing at its fastest point last May. So if you take last May and you add 21 more months 
we might not see the peak of rental inflation until February 2024, or you know, give or take, give or take, say six months. Uh, but the peak in rental inflation might not come until late this year or sometime next year, and that's 34% of inflation. So think about this: if it's 34% of inflation, and it's rising, say at just 8% per year, to so say it doesn't get any worse, it stays at 8% increase per year. That implies 2.3% inflation before you've looked at any other aspect of the CPI index. So uh, the problem here is if the rest of CPI goes up at say 2% per year, that implies 4% inflation. That's way above where the bond market thinks it's gonna be. The bond market thinks we're gonna have two or 3% inflation, not 4%. You know, so if inflation stays at 4%, bond yields could go higher that could put downward pressure on the equity market, which as we've seen is very highly valued and you know, potentially very fragile in the current environment. Um, so why have rentals been going up? Well, two reasons. First, mortgage rates have been soaring. They were 3% up until about a year ago. You could get by a 30-year you know, 30 fixed rate mortgage in the United States was 3%. Now that same mortgage is almost 7%. So it's more than doubled. Um, so this takes a lot of people who would have liked to have bought homes and forced them into the rental market. Uh, the other problem is that vacancy rates are extremely low. You know, the people, some people may be worried about a repeat of 2008. I'm not worried about a repeat of the global financial crisis. We're going to have maybe a different crisis. It's not going to look like the global financial crisis. You know, before the global financial crisis, there was huge amounts of vacancy, 10% of apartments in the United States were vacant. Today, that number is below, is around 5.8%. It's the lowest it's been since the early 1980s. Um, in terms of home owner vacancy rates, um, those are down to 0.8%, the lowest we've ever seen um, since the government began collecting data in the early 1960s. Um, so we're not gonna have a repeat of subprime. We're gonna have something very, very different. And so I think one of the questions is, so what part of the equity market is gonna be the winner? Uh, well, over the last decade, since the huge bull market began um, in March, 2009, uh, the really big winner has been the NASDAQ. Uh, tech dominated has done really, really well. Um, the S&P has done fine. Uh, the Russell 2000 has done okay. The Russell 2000 is an index of small cap stocks. It's been a bit of an underperformer. Uh, but the NASDAQ has done well for one reason, and that's that it is dominated by IT and technology companies. It also has a lot of big healthcare companies and big consumer discretionary companies. For example, Tesla is categorized as consumer discretionary. Um, I think the problem, though, uh, for investors who become enamored with the NASDAQ is that we have seen an almost perfect sector reversal between what happened in the first two years of this decade in 2020 and 2021 versus 2022. Um, basically every sector that did really well uh, back in the first two years of this decade um, did really badly last year. And every sector that did really poorly at the beginning of this decade suddenly started to do very well. Um, and so we've seen these kinds of sector reversals happen many times. So they typically happen once a decade in a really big way. For example, the winners of the 1990s were tech stocks. They were the big losers of the next decade from 2000 to 2009. Um, the big winners uh, from 2000 to 2009 were things like uh, consumer staples, health, materials, utility, and energy stocks. They were the big losers uh, during the 20 teens. Um, so I think we're heading for a major sector reversal, and that has a lot of implications for how the different equity indices that trade on our market could behave. Um, so for example, the S&P 500 and the Russell 2000 have had very similar performance uh, since the Russell index began in 1979. Um, in fact, if you look at a long-term chart, it looks like they do the same thing. But if you take the ratio of them, you see something very different. Um, you see very strong periods in which the Russell 2000 uh, goes up versus the S&P and very strong periods in which it goes down. And those periods often last maybe half a decade or more. Uh, but the key pattern to look for here is when it happens. So during the last great inflation, small cap stocks uh, back in the late 70s and early 80s 
way outperformed large caps. Um, you know, and the same thing happened during the recession in 1990 and 91. Um, the same thing happened uh, during the tech wreck in the early 2000s and during the global financial crisis. Small cap stocks prospered. Why? Because they have less debt and they're more nimble and they can move themselves and reposition themselves faster than big companies can. Um, so if we go through a period of economic turbulence, perhaps another recession next year, which looks increasingly likely, small caps could be the big outperformers. Um, I would just mention very briefly, there are times when large caps outperform, but they tend to outperform in the late stages of economic expansion, uh, like during the great expansion in the 1980s, the second half of the expansion in the 1990s, and the second half of the expansion during the 20 teens, that's the time to own large cap stocks. But it can be very, very risky now. Small cap stocks may be the big bargain here in the market. Um, just one last slide for you before I turn everything over to David. This is the Russell 2000 versus the NASDAQ. Um, the NASDAQ had a tremendous bubble in the late 1990s where it just massively outperformed small caps. Um, so if you take the Russell 2000 and you divide it by the NASDAQ 100, small caps just plummeted in terms of, large, in terms of you know, big tech companies and the NASDAQ 100. But then when the tech bubble popped in the early 2000s, everything went very strongly in reverse and small caps had a huge, huge outperformance. Well, small caps have been out, have been underperforming very strongly ever since about 2009, as we saw. Um, but I'm wondering maybe if that's about ready to reverse, uh, if a lot of these very highly valued tech stocks might respond poorly to a highly inflationary environment in which interest rates go up. Um, but a lot of smaller companies that people don't pay any attention to, that people have completely overlooked and ignored, uh, might be more nimble and fast acting about adjusting to a new environment. Um, so uh, I'm going to stop sharing my slide deck for a second. I'm going to let David put up his. And I'm going to turn things over to him. Um, David and I will take questions jointly at the end. So think of any questions you might have, um, and then you can uh, you can uh, ask them uh, to both of us uh, once David's presentation is over. All right, so David, over to you. Eric, can you see my screen? I can, yes. Yeah. All right, let me get into presenter mode then. That should be full screen now, yes? Yep, looks great. Brilliant, thank you. And, and thank you for that wonderful introductory part of the presentation. It's uh, an enormous amount of information uh, and it provides a very nice segue into the next portion where we're going to look very specifically at some equity index futures products uh, available at CME to perhaps take advantage of some of the opportunities that Eric has been suggesting in, in his economic presentation. I will begin by also reminding people that what we're doing today is meant to be educational and informative and in no way should be construed as investment advice, nor are we making any trading recommendations. You're going to see examples of potential trading strategies in the next few minutes, but they should not be considered as investment advice, nor recommendations to trade. Uh, Eric mentioned several of the major US stock market benchmark indices, and we have futures contracts that are based on these indices at CME Group. Our leading index products, US dollar index products, include futures contracts on the S&P 500, which is a large cap uh, capitalization weighted index. The NASDAQ 100, which is also a large cap uh, index, cap weighted. Uh, and then the Russell 2000, which has already been uh, alluded to as being a small cap index. And then the granddaddy of them all is the, um, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. At CME Group, we began listing equity index products in 1982. Uh, just as the uh, U.S. Uh, was coming out of its inflation shock uh, rate hikes and going into a period of economic growth with the listing of the S&P 500. And over the course of lifespan, we've added additional index products to that suite. Currently, 
of the, these four major US dollar indices, we offer them in two sizes. The standard E-mini versions you see here that have fixed multipliers of between uh, $5 and $50. And then we also have what we refer to as a micro suite of contracts with futures contract multipliers a tenth the size of the standard contracts. So the purpose of this is to expand our marketplace to market participants who may have felt uh, unable to participate in our markets because of the sizing of the standard e-mini contracts. So the micro contracts offer uh, an alternative to the same index priced futures contract, but in a smaller version. What we're gonna be looking at are basically uh, contracts that trade against similar indices and are settled in similar terms. On a, on a daily basis, our major indexes in the equity uh, suite settle to a, a volume weighted average price that's calculated at the close of, of the New York stock markets, uh, 3 p.m. Chicago time. Uh, in the last 30 seconds of trade, that volume weighted average in the futures contract results in the settlement value of the futures contracts. For at expiration, all of these are what are known as cash or financially settled futures contracts. They settle to a spot index level calculated by the actual index provider. So on final last trading day, which is the third Friday of a quarterly contract month, the S&P will settle to a special opening quotation calculated by the S&P company. The NASDAQ will settle to its special opening quotation of calculated by the NASDAQ and the Russell appropriately. They're settling to that spot index value, which means that the futures price and the spot index on that last day of trading settle to the same value. That's the mechanism that imposes the pricing integrity on the futures contract. If the futures contract were ever to get widely out of proportion, to the pricing of the actual spot index. There are plenty of Delta One desks and other proprietary trading firms that would simply buy what's cheap and sell what's rich in an arbitrage spread and force it either back into alignment or carry it all the way to expiration, knowing that the two prices will converge at expiration. So because of that, the market can trust and, and feels great confidence using the equity index futures for many purposes in terms of risk management, but also for risk creation. And we're gonna look at what that means in a few minutes, but you can see the growth in the activity in CME's equity index products, particularly last year with the increase in trading volatility. Uh, if you look at this chart, you'll see the light blue portions of the column representing futures volume, the darker blue tips at the top, like little match heads representing the proportion of volume done in options. And if you look at this graphic from left to right, you'll see options as a percentage of the total increasing with each uh, year moving from left to right. That's because options have become, not just at CME, but worldwide, a much more uh, actively used tool in terms of both risk management and trading. The green line shows a very important figure, which is what is known as open interest. And open interest represents positions that are open in a futures contract that have yet to be offset. Now, because it's a cash settled contract, anyone wishing to remain exposed to the futures contract as it approaches expiration simply rolls their position forward into the next quarterly contract. So usually about five to seven trading days prior to that third Friday of a quarterly expiration, the volume and the open interest will roll into the next quarterly contract. So as we approach the middle of March, which is currently the front month in equity index contracts, you'll begin to see that uh, by that, before that third Friday, almost 90 to 95% of the open interest will roll into the June contract to maintain those open positions. So in addition to the volume, the size of the open interest also denotes potential energy for future transactions. And this also gives our market participants confidence to use the futures product because they know that they can not only get in, but more importantly, they can get out or roll forward. 
So the idea of the high level of correlation between the futures product and its underlying benchmark index value has led to what is known as efficient beta to the benchmarks. And, and beta just means that the correlation is very high and the futures contracts provide that beta in, in many cases in a lower capital uh, or more capital efficient product than a cash related product. It allows uh, our end users who are involved in both markets uh, to be able to use the futures contract and free up cash for other purposes, like just regular business activities. It allows them to move in and out of the market when they need to seamlessly and, and efficiently in, in, in a very fast and efficient manner. And in many cases, it, it removes some of the human trading elements by being able to have a, a full exposure to an index without day trading particular shares to, to bring the portfolio up to its balance. But another key important aspect to futures versus either a cash basket of securities or even other uh, index products like mutual funds and ETFs is the very efficient means by which you can short a futures contract. Selling a futures contract or shorting a futures contract is the same as going long. It requires initial margins and maintenance margin, but in both cases, a long and a short position don't require full notional payment. That means that selling a futures position or, or going short a futures contract is much, much more efficient than shorting an ETF or even shorting an outright stock position because you don't have to borrow the security to short it. Borrowing a security to shorting it in the cash market results in a lending fee, adding an additional layer of expense to a short position. This means that futures contracts can be used as a short position against a cash position, against a, any other type of index type product, but they can also be used against a long futures position. And we're gonna take a look at what that means in practical terms in just a few minutes. Uh, Eric has done a wonderful job of setting us up for the impact of interest rates and, and how they affect the valuation of individual equities, and then by extension, what that might mean to equity indexes, uh, which are nothing more than composites of individual equity contrib uh, contributing shares. So if we look at the performance just in the last 12 months from February of 22 to the current period or current times, we can see our three major indices, the S&P 500 here represented uh, by its ticker symbol SPX, the NASDAQ 100, NDX, and the Russell 2000, RTY, show high levels of correlation in terms of their performance over the last 12 months, but with some variation. You'll notice the S&P being down 6.1%. The tech heavy NASDAQ 100 down 12% in the same period, and then the Russell 2000 small cap index down only 4%. So while they've been in the same direction and are relatively highly correlated, they're not perfectly correlated. And this has to do to some degree to the influence of interest rates and interest rate expense in the calculation of the value of the corresponding index itself. And it boils down to some of the things that Eric has already mentioned, which is the constituents that make up the index itself. When we look at the S&P 500, which is by far and away the most uh, widely used benchmark for large institutional investors in US dollars equity markets, you can see that as of the end of January, the S&P people in the calculation of the S&P index include in this largest constituent member, the information technology sector at 26.5%. Uh, at the beginning of 2022, this number was closer to 27 or 28% of the index valuation. Uh, 40 years ago, you would have seen energy probably populated at the same type of equivalency. So uh, things changed, the index changed, but at least in, in modern terms or in the last two years, Infotech has been the largest component of the S&P 500, but only between, say, 25 to 30 percent of the broad market index. If we look at the NASDAQ 100, which is a large cap stock index, you can see that technology 
as a sector represents over half of its index valuation. And it's followed uh, by telecoms, which are also uh, a sector that's influenced by rising interest rates. But technology, because of its consideration in growth companies or as a growth company, are widely impacted in terms of their valuation by forward or the, or the slope and level of forward interest rates. So the tech heavy NASDAQ 100 index has been more dramatically impacted, negatively impacted by rising rates in the last 12 months. If we consider the Russell 2000 index, you can see it's also widely diversified, but in small cap companies. And because most of the technology companies tend to be larger in capitalization in terms of their uh, com in uh, inclusion into these indexes, telecom and, and technology are smaller in the, in the Russell 2000 index. It's dominated by industrials and financials and healthcare companies. But again, smaller, smaller cap companies and a smaller exposure to a more interest rate sensitive sector like Infotech. So that if we consider the NASDAQ 100 futures contracts as they've performed in the last 12 months relative to rising rates here represented by a generic two-year treasury yield. You can see the two-year has gone from roughly one and a half percent last February to above four and a half percent currently. In that same period of time, up until about the turn of the year, the NASDAQ 100 trended lower. And uh, as was represented in an earlier slide, down 12% over this period of time. A little bit of a hook higher in the last couple of weeks, owing to the effect that the Fed is slowing down its rate of rate increases and also the market beginning to anticipate the Fed stopping its rate hikes. And in, and in fact, as alluded to earlier, potentially pricing in rate decreases in the latter half of this year, early part of the next year. So how might this be played out? Well, certainly users of the futures market can simply buy or sell the index futures themselves. And we have an expression at CME where the choice of the index matters. And you can see, depending on your point of view about the index or about how it might be impacted by rates, might affect your choice of index for a long or short market strategy. But there's another way to potentially trade the futures contracts and what I refer to as relative value strategies. This would be analogous to what we would call long short strategies. If you're, if you're a hedge fund investor or you're familiar with the way hedge funds position long and short positions, buying what they perceive to be relatively cheap and selling what they perceive to be relatively expensive. On, on, a, on a relatively neutral basis. It might be analogous to what you might call pairs trading uh, in stock trading, where you buy one uh, shares of one company and, and short sell shares of another, taking out the relative value difference between two highly correlated products. We call these things spreads in the futures world. And in, certainly in the equity index space, you're able to do what are known as equity index spreads. And all it is is simultaneously buying and selling two of these index futures uh, on a spread basis or as a spread trade. Very common and effective way to capture what you might perceive as to be the relative value between these indexed products. Uh, and because the index futures contracts are highly correlated themselves, there could be lower market risk and therefore lower outright or a net margin requirements in a spread trade versus an outright market position. Let's consider a couple of examples. And we're gonna go back to uh, ex an example that was alluded to a little bit earlier. If we consider uh, the Russell 2000 small cap index as a spread to the NASDAQ 100 index, in this case on a two to one basis because of their different valuations in terms of their notional value of futures contracts. And look at the way that spread performed within a rising interest rate environment here represented by the yield on the two year treasury. You can see that through most of 2022, a two to one ratio spread small cap to 
large cap or Russell 2000 to the NASDAQ 100 actually performed very, very well. Uh, the spread tails off here at the beginning of the year as uh, again, that, that the market's perception that the Fed may be slowing down rates or potentially stopping and easing late this year, early next year, uh, caused the spread to back up just a little bit. How did it perform over the course of the last 12 months? Well, the NASDAQ 100, the tech heavy NASDAQ has previously reported down 12%, where the Russell was only down about four. Uh, how that worked out from a PL standpoint on a two to one weighted spread, a net gain of $26,000, owing in large part to the gain made on the short position on the NASDAQ. This is again, one of the benefits of using a futures contract the ability to sell them short is as seamless as going long. And then if you look down in the bottom, because the spreads represent lower market risk to the clearinghouse, clearing rewards this type of a position with a 70% margin credit. So if you look at the uh, individual costs of initial margins on these positions and deduct from it a 70% credit, the net margin is significantly lower than the two legs by themselves, meaning that the return on the trade or return on the capital use to create this trade is significantly higher. Uh, this is a very attractive feature for both institutional and commercial users of our markets, but could also be extended to individual retail traders using the micro contracts because the same phenomena that's being used here in a spread transaction with lower net margin would be affected in micro contracts as well. Another example using other index products available at CME Group include two futures contracts from the Russell 1000 suite of products. Russell 1000 is a large cap index and it is also listed in two sub index 1000 products, one being the Russell 1000 value index, the other the Russell 1000 growth index. If we compare or look at the last 12 months trading history of Russell value represented in the purple line versus Russell growth in the red line, again, high levels of price action correlation. Um, and then you've got the blue generic two-year yield showing the rise in interest rates over the same period of time. Both of these indexes uh, moving, uh, you know, pretty much unchanged throughout the course of the year, but maybe slightly lower. If we consider looking at the Russell index composition, you'll notice that the growth index takes into account the large cap companies of the Russell 1000 that have higher price to book ratios. They're considered and, and are expected to be growth companies. That's why they're called the growth index. The Russell 1000 value includes those companies in the Russell 1000 that have lower price to book ratios and are considered uh, lower growth values, but have are priced at a lower price to book ratio. They might represent a greater value trade. So if one were looking to be more defensive in a equity falling environment, value might perform outperform growth. Or if one feels that just from a straight valuation standpoint, growth could be more negatively affected by higher interest rates than value, one might choose to express that by being long value and short growth as a spread, taking out that relative value difference between the two indices themselves. And if we compare a one-to-one -one value to growth spread over the last 12 month rate rising environment, you'll see that throughout most of 2022, value did indeed as a spread outperform growth over that period with that similar hook down uh, into uh, the new year, resulting primarily from expectations of change in rate policy. Over the 12 month period, value was only down less than 1% where growth was down almost 11 and a half, resulting in a spread long value short growth of almost $15,000 on a one-to-one -one spread basis. And once again, because of the high level of correlation in the indexes themselves, there is a margin credit relief allowed to this spread of 50%, which means that 
instead of having to post $12,000 of margin on the outright legs, you would have posted 6,000, boosting the return on capital as a future spread, as opposed to uh, other ways to replicate that same risk in either mutual funds or ETFs or baskets of the individual indexes themselves. So hopefully this gives you an example of how futures contracts can be used to replicate the risk of indexes themselves, either outright, long, or short, or might be considered as potential relative value trades as index spreads against them as either broad market indexes or more refined indexes like uh, Russell value, Russell growth. That concludes my, my formal remarks. And I think what we'll do now is open up uh, the webinar to questions from the audience. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can uh, potentially share individually as necessary. Welcome back, Eric. Yes, thank you. That was a great presentation, David. Very interesting. I really love the uh, charts you had, especially on the um, the sector weightings for the Russell, the NASDAQ, and the S&P 500. It really does show you how they can perform so differently from time to time. In addition to the capitalization differences, just what it composes them can be so vastly different. Well, that's one of the things and the reasons why I love this, this Tim McCourt tagline where choice of index matters. Uh, and if you're tracking stock indices, it's very important to understand the constituent makeup of the underlying index itself because they do perform differently uh, in different market environments. Uh, these were the sorts of things that you pulled out in your presentation, but are also highlighted in, in the price performance of, uh, of the various uh, spreads that were demonstrated in, in my part of the presentation. So uh, I, don't, I don't see any questions coming in. Are there any questions from uh, any of the audience at this point? Yeah, I just typed into the chat, you know, please type in any questions, we're happy to answer. You have both of us online for, I guess, up to, I don't know, half an hour more if you want. You have plenty of time. I know it's late for a lot of the participants here in Europe, <laughs> including for me. It's already seven o'clock in the evening, so I understand you know, people might not be you know, wanting to ask questions, but let's see if we have any. Maybe give it another minute here, another couple minutes. Looks like one just came in, Eric. Oh yeah, here we go. Yeah, so what does it say? Uh, what would you consider a good source of further educational material where you can do a deep, deep dive into the impact of each sector? Um, mm -hmm. I don't know, do you... We have at CME on our website, a link to our educational portal. Uh, which is known as CME Institute. And if you go to the website and you click on education, it'll take you to Institute and you can find some, potentially some information, uh, certainly information about sectors themselves, but also there's uh, additional third party com commentary that might, uh, might be a source of intelligence on the sectors themselves. I see a question here that I, I might take. Uh, do you see a recovery in the tech industry? Um, so, look, the tech industry has been recovering very strongly so far this year. So far this year, we've seen a huge, huge rebound, um, you know, in the NASDAQ 100, um, you know, a lot of big rallies in, uh, you know, in Tesla, Meta's had a huge, huge rally, um, a lot of, you know, really strong performance in Microsoft, particularly after they, they came out with this uh, chat GPT, which, um, you know, seems to be getting a little bit more scrutiny now than it did at the very beginning. Um, like anything's possible. There are both upside risks and downside risks. Um, a lot, you know, the big difference I think between the situation today in 2023 and the tech wreck back in 2001 
in the tech wreck, none of these tech companies had very strong earnings. Um, you know, so they were all kind of uh, very fragile in terms of their earnings picture. Um, you know, and a lot of them didn't make any money at that time. This time, 22 years later, uh, these are hugely, hugely profitable firms. Uh, but even very profitable firms can become overvalued. Uh, people can be willing to pay too much to hold their stock. Um, so like, I think that it's possible the tech industry could see a, a recovery in terms of its prices. And we have indeed seen that um, so far this year, but um, you know, during bear markets, you very often see really strong counter trend rallies. Um, if you look back at the bear market from 2000 to 2002, um, there were huge rallies inside of that bear market. Um, during the global financial crisis, there were occasionally periods of three, four months where the stock market went up. Um, so I would treat these, um, val these rallies with a great deal of caution. Um, it's possible they could turn into lasting bull markets, but it's also possible um, that they could founder and wind up going back down. Um, there's another question here. I'd like to know where I can learn more about the kind of valuation showed in the last two examples. Um, uh, I don't know, is that the last two examples that you gave, David, or the last two examples I gave? I'm not sure. Um, do you know? I don't. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the, the, evalu the the examples that, uh, that I gave are just simply based on the notional equivalent size of the futures contracts relative to each other. The idea in the in the spread trade is to be as dollar neutral to market exposure as possible. So by having them weighted uh, like two to one, Russell to Nasdaq is based on the, uh, uh, the notional equivalent values of the futures contract. The value versus growth are basically a one to one trade anyway. So uh, and by the way, that's also how the margin really is set. So that's my answer to that question. I don't know, Eric. Are you uh, still still available? Yeah, I am. I'm still available. I actually turned my camera off for a really dumb reason. So our lights here are on a timer, and yeah. so I had to turn my camera off while I got up and ran around the room to turn the lights back on. Uh, so I think I'm good now for another 15 minutes before I have to move again. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I assume that's what they mean. I think hopefully you answered uh, Leona's question on that one. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, in terms of valuations, I look at you know equity valuations in a lot of different ways. They all kind of give the same thing. You can look at price to book ratios, price to earnings, price to sales. Um, I look at equity market cap to GDP sometimes, um, you know, and also versus our dividend futures. The dividend futures are, you know, um, say, mainly used by institutional investors, but anybody I think can find them. Uh, um, find them interesting. So she responded, Leona responded, she said, that was my question, thanks, but I'm wondering uh, more, if there was something more on the CME uh, to learn about spread trading like you showed. So Dave, is there anything more on our website that she can there go is, and take a look at? There is through CME Institute. If you go into the Institute's uh, curriculum, there will be specific uh, archive material on spread trading. Uh, there are some archive things on index spreads like we just covered in this webinar uh, that go into maybe a little more detail about the actual construction of the trades. So by all means, uh, check out CME Institute through the educational tab on, on uh, cmegroup.com. Yeah, so cmegroup.com educational tab. Yeah, I mean, there should be a whole bunch of more information in there. And you know, maybe... Maybe we can uh, have Tickmill uh, send out some of those links too. That'd be yeah, that's great. Do you see the question about uh, the Fed? Can can uh, the Fed still engineer a soft landing? Oh um, yeah, so the yeah, that's a good question. The Fed, the Fed sometimes you know, I, I mean, the Fed would like probably to engineer a soft landing. The Fed would like all this just to magically go away. You know, the <laughs> Fed would love, you know. Inflation is to go right back to normal and unemployment could be low and everything would be sort of, you know, happy and, and peaceful. And um, the Fed has always had trouble engineering soft landings, but sometimes they do manage to do it. Uh, for example, 
in the 1980s, when we came out of that recession in the early 80s, um, uh, the recession was in 81 and 82. Um, then in 83 and 84, we had the strongest economic growth I think we've ever seen in peacetime. Um, the economy had a, about a year and a half period where it was growing at an eight to nine percent per year, uh, which was too fast. So the Fed raised rates and they managed to engineer a soft landing in the middle of the 1980s, uh, where in 85 and 86, the economy slowed way down, but it kept growing. Um, there were sectors of the economy that were in recession. It was a terrible time for farmers. The auto manufacturers didn't do well. Um, the oil companies were doing badly because the price of oil crashed. But overall, the economy is doing well. The service sector was doing great. Wall Street was doing great. Um, you know, and in the 1990s, we also had the Fed successfully engineer a soft landing. Um, you know, the Fed raised rates 300 basis points in 1994. Um, the economy did slow down a lot in 95 and 96. Uh, but then it picked way back up and did really well in 97, 98, 99. Um, so a, a soft landing is possible. Um, it's very, very tricky to achieve. And I think it's not going to be easy this time uh, because the economy is so volatile right now uh, because of all of the pandemic disruption, which is, you know, in some ways, the pandemic disruption is getting better. Like the supply chain problems have gone away. But during the pandemic, the federal government in the United States, States spent an additional $6 trillion beyond its ordinary budget. Um, and that kicked off a massive wave of inflation. Um, and so now the Fed doesn't really know how to get this under control. Um, and the same thing, by the way, is happening in Europe uh, to a smaller extent in Japan, but it's happening in Latin America. Um, countries all over the world have sent interest rates to the moon. We have very high levels of debt and leverage. Um, I would say a soft landing is still possible, um, but it's going to be very, very tricky for them to achieve. I've got one question here about the metals markets. Um, ah, well, you know, the metals markets are going to be part of the subject of our next webinar. Uh, okay. So we didn't really talk a lot about commodities here, but I think the next webinar we do on the same platform uh, with Tick Mill is going to be purely focused on commodities. Um, so I'm going to give my best to answer it here. Um, I think the transition metals are really interesting, um, especially since Congress in the United States passed this new legislation last fall, uh, which appropriated $1.2 trillion in infrastructure investment, um, some portion of which was for green investments, maybe at least two or $300 billion in green investments. The price of copper really took off. Uh, especially versus um, other commodities that it's normally somewhat linked to, like oil. Um, and so, you know, I think that copper could do well out of the green transition. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the United States is not the only country investing in this. China, Japan, uh, the European Union countries are investing a lot. Um, and, you know, if we create recharging stations for hundreds of millions of new vehicles, that's going to be a lot of demand for copper. Um, as we you know, replace gas stoves somewhat controversially in the United States with electric stoves, that's more new copper. Um, yeah, and so there's going to be a lot of demand uh, for copper. And then, of course, lithium and cobalt are two of the key battery metals. Uh, we have futures on both of these um, at CME Group. They're relatively young futures. Um, but the cobalt future in particular is gaining a lot of volume and a lot of transaction. Um, the lithium future is starting to pick up. Uh, I think soon we're going to be launching a molly. This is a metal I always, I can never pronounce. I always want to call it molly bednum, but apparently it's molybdenum or something. Uh, molly, uh, for short, not to be confused with the party drug, um, is also going to be launched on CME at some point, I believe, in the next few months. Uh, so we're very, very involved in space. We're very interested in it. And I will make sure in our next uh, presentation we um, include. Um, all of these things. There's another question here. Can we get the presentation? The answer is yes. Um, I will PDF my version of the presentation, my part of it, uh, send it to Tickmill and they can distribute it. Um, we're very happy to do that. Um, do you plan to include energy commodities, not gas and oil, in the next or future webinar? And yes, that's going to be the next webinar. Next webinar is going to be all commodities. We're going to talk about not gas, we're going to talk oil, talk about metals in a very broad sense, including copper, cobalt, um, lithium, um, 
but also gold, silver, um, you know, aluminum, other metals. And then we're going to do the agricultural goods as well. So we're going to talk about corn, wheat, soybeans, um, and related products. Uh, so we're going to cover all those things in the next webinar. Uh, that webinar is also going to talk a lot about what's going on in China economically, which is a huge influence on all of the commodity markets, um, as well as how the commodity markets relate to things like currencies and interest rates. Excellent. All right, do we have any other questions? I'm not really seeing any other questions, but we have a little extra time if anyone has any. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other questions coming up, but if there are other questions, you can always um, email them to Tickmill and they can pass them on to us and we'll do our best to, to answer them. Um, otherwise, we look very, very much forward to seeing you for the next installment um, of this webinar, um, which will be uh, in March. I forget the date, I can't remember the date. Do you remember the date, David? Tickmill will send out plenty of, plenty of notices. Yeah, they'll get plenty of, plenty of publicity, I'm sure, for it. Um, that will focus on commodities. We'll be doing a third one after that that I think we'll be focusing. Um, we haven't really decided what it's going to focus on, but let us know what you want in the comments, either this time or next time. We'll focus it on whatever you guys want the next time. But we, we haven't really talked much about currencies. We could do more on rates. Um, plenty of markets to talk about. Um, and then also I will be doing um, an in-person appearance with Tick Mill at the Shard here in London. Um, I also can't quite remember the date. I'm tempted to say the 23rd of March, but don't quote me on that. It could be the wrong date. So um, 23rd of March, I don't think that could be right because that's a Saturday, but it's going to be sometime in late March. Uh, Tickmill will also send you out things like that. If you happen to be in London, um, that would be great. All right. Well, it was really great being with you. Um, do you have thank anything you else, David? No, thank you all for your time, your interest, and your patience. Uh, we wish you the very best of luck, and we'll see you at, uh, at our next event in March. Eric, thank you. As always, it's a pleasure working with you, and uh, everyone have a nice weekend. Thanks, you too.